Hill, wherever you may be this morning. Excited to be able to be in the house. Excited to have air in my lungs. So many times we, we look at the current situation and we say, man, I wish. But the truth is, this is how it is right now. And we're just going to keep having faith. We're going to keep believing. We're going to recognize that God is moving us ahead. He's making us more like him. And that's what's important this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I love you. I thank you. I'm extremely grateful just for the fact that I have life. And I have life more abundant. At times it seems like I don't, especially uh, in this time. But Lord, as I look out through the rest of the world, I could have it so much worse. Let us not to forget that you came with one goal in mind. And that was for the kingdom of heaven. It was for the Father. You never worried about earthly possessions, earthly wealth, earthly relationships as much as you worried about what can I do to advance the kingdom of heaven. And so I pray our perspective change. I pray through the word today that we have faith. That, Lord, there's a faith that would stir inside of us. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I pray that people would hear this word today and have faith. That they would take hold and take heed and recognize that, Lord, it's your love and it's your blood that's going to get them through. It's not about the things that we can do, but it's about the thing you already did, and that was Calvary. So I'm grateful for your blood this morning, and I'm grateful for the fact that I live in Texas and that I am able to be able to speak your word lord and i just pray that we continue after you our heart would be for you our heart would be for your communities for your people and lord if our neighbor hurts let us help them let us to look right now and in, into our communities and find out who needs help. Lord, I thank you for the word that's going to be given. I pray that it's transformational, that it's uplifting, that it's enlightening, that it's the thing that we need to be able to get us through these hard times because we know that's what your word does. And I thank you for our pastor. I pray that you continue to lift him up, give him wisdom. Honor him, Lord, as a vessel of honor that he is. And I'm grateful for the fact that he leads us. But, Lord, first of all, he listens. He listens to you. And that's what we look for, Lord, your words today. And I thank you for everything you're doing in our lives. We pray for our new Caney campus, that, Lord, people would show up. Then, irregardless of the rain, that, Lord, your word is coming forth and we love you we thank you we lift it up and we give this to you in jesus name amen and amen amen thank you pastor david you guys got your bibles i pray you do i want you to open to hebrews chapter 11 i'll be there in a minute we're so excited to be with you online here at holywild.tv and on youtube it's a, it's an amazing venue we're reaching people all around the United States and the world, so it's, uh, it's, it's kind of crazy. I'll be honest with you. I just did, a lot of pastors and I have talked about this as a unique place to be into. Hey, you know, you know, you know what I miss? Not only do I miss seeing you, I miss having the band up here and the worship. Could you just take a minute at home and give God a little praise? God, we love you. We thank you for this day. It's the day that you have made here in South Texas. It might be a little wet, but we love you. We thank you, God, for pouring your blessing and your grace upon, upon us. Lord, we weep with those who weep, rejoice with those that rejoice. We thank you for the word of God in Jesus' name. I want to say, especially to those that are working in, in the medical field right now, dealing with the virus and uh, those that are having making some hard decisions. We have an RN nurse that has already gone to New York City. We have another RN that's uh, uh, contacted me this week, Pastor. I'm planning on going to New York City. That's where the hotbed of this thing is. And so I said, you know, when people came here during Hurricane Harvey where uh, we needed help, I'm glad the folk were going to New York City to help them there. We'll believe in God for quick recovery and great things. You've got your Bibles in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 6, I'll be there in a minute, but first, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. There are several words. Years ago, uh, I took a, 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 a tremendous patriarch of the faith, a man named A.D. Van Hoos, out to eat. He lived in Evansville, Indiana, had a powerful church. He's my, he was my pastor's pastor before he passed. I took him out to eat, and I said, Brother A.D., I just want you to tell me. Someday I'm going to pastor a church. Now, this would have been 28 years ago or longer. I said, one day I'm going to pastor a church, and I want you to give me some advice. And these were the, this was the advice he gave me. 
we were eating at little Grandy's is the name of the place, and he was eating a little chicken fried steak. And he looked at me, took a bite of the, the, the steak, and said, Now, Pastor, when you become a pastor, you've got to remember that a pulling mule can't kick. And I looked at him kind of strange. I said, What do you mean a pulling mule can't kick? He said, As long as you keep the mule pulling, it can't kick you. I thought, well, that's a good word. So what he meant was keep the church pushing ahead. Remind yourself, guys, uh, we may look empty in here, but you're deployed. You're to keep moving and pressing forward and doing something. Then he said, second thing he said to me, uh, if I could remember, it just kind of slipped my mind. Does that happen? He probably did his too. Well, but as we, we began to talk and he began to, to bring things in, oh, he said, preach the front page. I said, excuse me? He said, look at the newspaper and Preach the front page. Whatever is going on, realize the Word of God has an answer for it. So I started looking at what's going on. There's several things that I've seen, and we've been trying to, to bring them out. But one of them is the words essential and unessential. That there are certain things, certain people that are essential, certain people that are non-essential. I saw where a pastor posted this today. He said, I'm opening up the, the church. And people said, oh, can we come in? He said, no, it was just for essential people, for people to make sure that the online service. Said, oh, man, I wouldn't put that out. Because to me, everyone is essential the, to, to pick this up, to realize this, to grab hold of it. But let's break it down because what's happened is, is this, this a little bit of pride has rose up because, you know, I'm the, I'm the garbage collector, so I'm essential, or I'm, I'm in the hospital, I'm essential, or I work for the police department and sit in the car and eat donuts, I'm essential. I apologize for that to all my police friends out there. But what is really essential? So I started putting together a little thought, and as I put it together, I, I walked out of my office and started walking. And I said, God, I, I got my thoughts down, but I need to arrange them in such a way that people would catch it. And it was like he just downloaded inside my spirit. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. But I want to focus on these three points. That in the gospel, there are three major essential principles we live by. The word essential means absolute necessary, extremely important, crucial, necessary. It's key, it's vital, it's indispensable, it's needed, it's required. Let me tell you what's required of us, particularly us believers. And if you're an unbeliever watching this, I'm telling you, this is where you're heading in life because I believe you're going to accept Christ and, and God's got some abundant things for you. But that is faith, hope, and love. Our faith is essential. It's absolutely necessary. It's extremely important. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, and without faith it is impossible to please God uh, as a matter of fact because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him I like being rewarded you like being rewarded so let's seek after God say this with me when I believe God I please God when I believe God I please God amen so without faith it's impossible Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 now and again some of this you've got to look up with me it says now faith was being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I haven't seen it yet, but I believe for it. Uh, it it's evidence there. It's substance there. But I've got to believe for it and bring it into my life. That is absolutely biblical. People say, now, Pastor, come on, you can't see it. You can't see that virus, and yet you know it's there by the results. You can't see God, and yet you know he's there by the results. If you breathe air, the Scripture says that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. So if I'm breathing in air, it reminds me there's God. Amen. He breathed in us the, the breath of life, if you would. Romans 1.17 says, for in the gospel, quoting out of the book of Habakkuk, I love when the Bible quotes the Bible. And sometimes you read the New Testament, it's quoting the Old Testament. For in the gospel, the righteousness of of God is revealed, a righteousness which is by faith from first to last, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So if you're going to serve God, you've got to live by faith. Uh, you know, we'll say stuff like this, and I know to certain people this sounds strange, that the weak say I'm strong, that the poor say I'm rich, that the blind say I can see, that the lame say I can walk. What is that? That is reaching by faith into something I cannot see and bring it into my life where I'm at now. The scripture says, if I seek after God, he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Faith is essential. All through the word of God. This is a theme that runs through your Bible. Amen. Abraham, Noah, Moses, Elijah, David, Joshua, Rahab. It was fear versus faith. Amen. All through your Bible, you're going to see it. That's why preachers have got to rise up. And I'm praying, Pastor, that you're able to reach a congregation and talk to them about this. But look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11 while you're there, verse 33. Through acts of faith, they toppled kingdoms, made justice work, 
took the promises for themselves. They were protected from lions, fires, and sword thrust, turned disadvantage to advantage, won battles, routed alien armies. Women received their loved ones back from the dead. There were those who, under torture, refused to give in and go free, preferring something better, a resurrection. Others braved and braved abuse and whips and, yes, chains and dungeons. We have stories of those who were stoned, sawed in two, murdered in cold blood, stories of vagrants wandering the earth in animal skins, homeless, friendless, powerless. The world didn't deserve them, making their way as best they could of this cruel edges of the world. I read this and I think to myself, God, help us stand up. It's only been a month. If our, if our strength is so small, God, help us, amen, to have faith and believe you for the best, that, the, that things are going to turn around. And if i got to go through some hard times, then it can happen. But here, faith, faith dispels. It removes fear out of your life. Everybody faces fear. Nobody's exempt. Everybody's going to have moments in their life where fear tries to invade. The problem is if fear stays too long, it causes a phobia. A phobia is a fear carried too far. It results when fear and reason don't keep in touch. Listen, let me say it again. It, 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 it's there when, when, whenever fear and reason don't keep in touch. When fear builds its power over us, it shackles our hands. It keeps us from doing the routine things in life, worrying Playing, living, serving God, we give into the slavery of terror. I'm telling you that fear does not stop death. As a matter of fact, it stops life. Whenever fear is in your life, it will shut you down. And worrying does not take away tomorrow's troubles. It takes away today's peace. There are six main categories that we face when it comes to fear. Poverty, we don't want to go back to it. Uh, criticism, nobody likes to be criticized. Loss of love, had it once, we lost it, we're afraid to go back and try it again because of fear, illness, we're scared of being, of getting sick. You know, there are a lot of people wouldn't even go to the hospital now for fear of the virus. They, they're sick at home and afraid to get sick at the hospital. Old age, listen, you can't stop age. If, if you keep living day to day to day, you're going to get old. It's just the way it is. And then death, and death happens with everyone. It's going to happen, by the way. Did you know there is a seventh one? Public speaking. Whew. You know, I, I do very little Facebook Live. I've done it, but a lot of things you see of me on the online is me recording something because I have this thing about uh, messing up. I'm known for pulpit slips and saying things that are a little bit derogatory, a little bit. I get nervous. It's tough to speak in front of people, and it's even tougher to speak in front of an empty church to a, to a, 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 a what is that thing called? A camera. It's even tougher to do that toward the camera. Public speaking can be, it, if I ask certain people to come up here and speak, they just start shaking. They get nervous. There was a, a, a young pastor fixing to preach to his congregation for the very first time. He went to his mentor and he asked him, he said, sir, what should I do if I get nervous? He said, well, son, he said, just get you a bottle of water and fill it up with vodka. Just put vodka in that bottle and set it right there next to the pulpit. And if you get nervous, you just reach down there and you take you a sip. Amen. So as he began to preach, uh, he got nervous and he, he took him a sip and he preached a little more and he took him another sip and he, he, took, he preached a little more and he opened it up and he drank a little bit more. So the next Sunday, he took his mentor's advice and he did that. And as he began to, to drink, he proceeded to talk up a storm. Upon his return to his office after the service, he found the following note on the door. It was written from his mentor. Number one, sip the vodka, don't gulp. Number two, there are ten commandments, not twelve. There are twelve disciples, not ten. Peter and Paul were consecrated, not constipated. <laughs> we do not refer to Jesus Christ as the late J.C. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are not referred to as Daddy Junior and Spooky. David slew Goliath. He did not kick the stuffing out of him. And then he recommended, he said, the recommended grace before the meal is not rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, 
Thanks for the grub. Yo, yeah, oh God. Amen. So oftentimes you've got to be careful when you're public speaking. And I say all this in kind of humor, but I'm telling you, there are certain fears that will grip your life. You've got to be careful. Fear did not come from your father. Romans 8, 15 says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. I'm a blessed man. That as a dad, I've adopted three children. And the adoption of those kids, I want to tell you something. Look at that scripture again. We did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship whereby you cry, Abba, Father. You've been adopted into the body. And because of that, you've got a father. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have, he's got best results for you. Amen. He's got the, he, you're in his mind. He thinks about, you are essential when it comes to the father. He loves you so much and like that. And as a dad, my kids have never had to wonder, is anybody going to love me? Is anybody going to care? Hey, I adopted them. They know I'm going to embrace them and love them through life no matter what comes. Fear, my friend, fear discourages God's people. I told you a month ago in this pandemic, before it broke, that there would be this uh, spirit of fear that would move among people, and then after that, discouragement would come. And we're seeing that. We're seeing protests rise up in America. What is that about? They're discouraged. They've lost courage. They want to go back to work. They want to get back involved in life. Fear is more infectious than any disease you can name. It roams the landscape, and it will discourage God's people. Fear is worry gone too far. Jesus said, deal with it. In the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 33, he said, listen, in life, seek first the kingdom of righteous, uh, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, whatever it is that you need, will be added to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So let me help you. How do, how do, I, how do I deal with fear, Pastor? I'm going to give you some ideas here. First, confront fear honestly. Just be honest about it. Here's some, here's some perspective for you. 80% who get the virus are not hospitalized. The other 18% recover. Why do you put yourself in the 2%? You know, I'll take these odds in life at anything and any time. Amen. Give me a 98% chance of surviving on my Harley, on my horse, in my hot rod, jumping out of an airplane, bungee jumping, zip lining, give, uh, uh, diving with sharks. Give me 98%, my friend. I'll take Quit putting yourself in the 2%. You don't have to be you're in Texas, my friend, or, or, or you're in, in, in South Dakota. There, I, there is a hotbed there. We're praying it in the name of Jesus, amen, that it'll be pushed back. And that disease will be put under, if you would, that tyrant, that invisible thing that we can't see. Second, confess your worry is sin. Worry is sin. I can't add heads to my head. I can't add length to my stature. Amen. It doesn't happen. Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Last night, I had a hard time falling asleep, so I just began to seek the Lord. It's amazing what happens when you begin to seek Him, and, and God begins to give you peace, and then, pe and then you begin to fall asleep. He delivered me from all my fears, not some, but all of them. And third, stand on God's Word. Proverbs 3, 25, have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. Have no fear. So all through Scripture, faith had to rise up in the lives of men and women. And we see that faith was confronting fear. It's a theme that moves all through it. So faith is essential. Second thing that is essential is hope. My friend, absolutely necessary. It's extremely important. Hebrews 6, 19 says we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. You need to realize that that anchor holds that ship, amen, as the, as the waves of, of life and fear and worry and things start hitting it. But I have this hope. Hope is such a powerful thing. In Luke chapter 24, verse 1, the resurrection, we preached about it last week, amen, was essential. Heartbroken, hopeless, sad, the morning, knowing that Jesus had died on the cross and been put into a tomb. The scripture says on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. You want to talk about hope? Amen. As they went there, their hearts were tore out. 
This is Mary and, and, and the mother, and, and, and they, they get there. The Scripture says that with the two men sitting on the, each side of the tomb, they, they were angels, and they, they're sitting there with a proclamation. Why are you looking for the dead among the living? Amen. This is the wrong place of the living among the dead. You know, he has, and I love the words, he has risen. My friend, if that doesn't give you hope today, we realize that his resurrection gives an assurance, first, the forgiveness of sins. That's essential. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sin. If Jesus didn't come up, you're still in your sins, man. None of this even matters what we're doing right now. But I believe I have faith, amen, that there's a heaven. I have faith, there's God. He's changed my life, amen. He turned things around in your life. This is the God of God we serve. We realize that this resurrection, his resurrection, gives us our only hope beyond the grave. It's essential. It's to know if I, if that, as bad as this virus is, I'm starting to hear politicians quote the word of God. It's crazy. I'm hearing them use because they know that this book is essential for what people are going through right now. And not only that, as they move through life, if some happen that they pass from this life and transition to the next, there has to be a hope. And that hope started with Easter, with the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 16 says, If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't because he was indeed dead. And if Christ wasn't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died hoping in Christ and the resurrection because they've already in their graves. If all we get out of Christ, listen to this, is a little inspiration for a few short years. Let me tell you, I have met people that got involved with God for a little while and just a couple of years, a little inspiration, and then they were gone. They lost their hope. We're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. Hallelujah. The scripture says in Thessalonians are dead and Christ will rise first. I don't know all about the mystery, but I do know this, that, that one day those that have been absent from the body that are present with the Lord are going to come back. And God's going to give them a new body and come up out of the grave. However symbolic or, or however this thing is going to take place is not for me to know. All I know is this, that God has a better place for us and I have this hope. Hope is essential. When you hope, you pray. Prayer is essential. I cannot tell you how important it is uh, or how important prayer is, but I'll try. It divided the Red Sea. It made a rock gush water in the wilderness. It quenched the flames of fiery furnace. It muzzled the jaws of lions and voided the poison of vipers. It conquers devils and dispatches angels. The disciples, disciples never said, Lord, teach us to sing. They never said, Lord, teach us how to play music. Lord, teach us how to fast, teach us how to preach. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Because prayer changes things. Prayer turns things around. Amen. In Luke chapter 11, he said, that When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Every day. Give me my daily bread, amen, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have, have sinned against us. Lead us not in temptation. You know, when I, when I read that, that's what it's telling me. I'm going to say it to you again. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that sins. You see, you can't pray and stay mad. Can't do it. If you're going to pray, Jesus said, you're going to pray. You can't stay mad at people. You can't pray and talk about your pastor. Or fellow church family. You can't pray and stay grouchy. You can't pray and stay negative. You can't pray and have a defeatist attitude. You can't do it. Because I'm going to say, God, right off the bat, forgive David, forgive Josiah, forgive Sam, forgive those that have trespassed against me. Forgive me for trespassing against them. And in so doing, I open up this, and I, I give clarity into my soul. You got to be optimistic. Amen. I, I talked about that this week. You can't be optimistic if you got a mystic optic. A feeling or belief that good things will happen in the future. You know, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. Now, faith is essential. Mm. Hope is essential. I have this hope that pretty soon this pandemic will be lifted. Businesses will flourish. The houses of God will fill. People that didn't know Christ 
through this pandemic came to him and are looking for a new life in Christ. I have this hope for my children and my children's children that they'll never have to go through what we're going through right now. I have this hope. I also have this honesty, and I'm a realist. I know that if we go through it again, we can handle it. Whatever we get thrown at. Love. Faith, hope, and love. The Scripture says that this is the greatest. It, and it's, I know when you say it's the greatest, what he's saying is that faith is activated by love. Hope is activated by love. Amen. This one word activates everything else in my life, so it's very important. It's absolutely necessary. 1 John 3, 11. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know that love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. You, you want to know about love? It's what Jesus did for us. He laid down his life. For our brothers and sisters, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. Now, you know, we could have preached this a year ago. But right now, this is Scripture with legs on it. To be able to say, okay, I have an abundance. I have things in my home, and I can be a blessing to other people. I'm not going to hold that back. I'm going to make sure if somebody needs something, I'm gonna, I don't want anybody to go to bed hungry. Amen. I want people to be blessed. To be able to be taken care of. That's what he's saying here. Romans chapter 14 verse 19. I want you to look at this principle. It's a principle to live by. I've been practicing this principle now for 30 something years. Limit your liberty by your love. God, you know, once you get a principle inside of you. And you violate that principle. It's like the Holy Ghost to put his finger on it. And say, hey, back up a little bit. Look what you just did. And I got to remind myself. Look at this with me. So let's agree to use all our energy in getting along with each other. Help others with encouraging words. Church, you have been deployed. You've been deployed to write letters, to send texts, to make phone calls, to reach out to your neighbor, to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, pastor, they don't love God. It doesn't say they love God. It says just love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. To reach out. You have been deployed to do that, to take care of that. Then he says, don't drag them down by finding fault. You're certainly not going to permit an argument over what is served or not served at supper to wreck God's work among you, are you? Now, he's using an example here. Go back, go back if you would, Mike. He's using an example here for a reason. Don't drag people down by finding fault. One of the things we're seeing right now is when the shutdown took place, people started finding fault with others. Well, you know, they're not six foot apart. They're four foot apart. They, they got nervous. Uh, this is how, And we begin to find fault with other people. We began to find fault with government officials. Now, we got to back off just a little bit and say it again. Limit your liberty by your love. I'm going to find out how much that I love by being able to let go of some of my liberties. Now, we're all about freedom. Oh, I got the right to do this. I got a right to have church. Well, if I love my neighbor, I'm not going to bring everybody in here right now and affect them. So that's why we got the drive-in service. I'm looking for some loopholes that will still keep people secure and look after them. But keep looking with me. I said it before, and I'll say it again. Paul speaking, all food is good, but it can turn bad if you use it badly. If you use it to trip others up and then send them sprawling. When you sit down to a meal, your primary concern should not be to feed your face, but to share the life of Jesus. So be sensitive and courteous to the others who are eating. Don't eat or say, do things that might interfere with the free exchange of love. Pastor, what's all that mean? I'm going to help you out right now. There are things in life that, uh, we, that are known as scruples. Now, a scruple, I know that's a new word for many of you. A scruple is one of the things I can't prove, you can't disprove. But a scruple is a sin to somebody else that's not to you. Uh -huh. See, I've gotten in trouble with some of this. Because you have the right to eat whatever you want. But Paul is dealing with Jews and Gentiles. You've got Gentiles eating pork chops in front of the Jews. You're upsetting the Jews because they don't eat pig. They're eating bacon sandwiches over here, and they're eating something over here that's kosher. You know, so they, there's this big fight going on here. And Paul said, look, if you've got liberty to do something, you can go ahead. But not everything you do is expedient or good. You've got to limit your liberty by your love. So if you invite a Jewish brother over, don't feed him a pork chop. Feed him something that he's not uh, overly sensitive about. 
Don't say, well, that's just the way we do it down here. Amen. You know, we eat the mud bugs, or we eat this, or we eat shrimp, we eat that. I understand that. But if I'm trying to win somebody, take, for instance, uh, this issue right here, drinking. Now, your pastor hasn't had a drink since November the 9th, 1979. How do you know, Pastor, you ain't had a drink since November the 9th, 1979? That was a long time ago. Because I got born again November the 10th, 1979. So November the 9th, I'm sure that I was pretty much lit that night, okay? I'm just telling you that's the way I was back then. Now, people would invite me over to their homes back in the early days, and they would be teetotalers, you know, sipping saints. And they would, they would say, you want a beer? And I would have to say, no, but I want one. I want to smell your breath. I want to remind myself of what it's like. I, I'll be honest with you. I enjoyed the flavor of beer. I drank my first Slitz malt liquor when I was six years old. I remember it. Uh, so, so I have these memories of drinking from the time I was young to the time I quit. But if you invite me into your house and I don't drink and you offer me a beer, at that moment you need to limit your liberty by your love. Put your beer back in the fridge. Again, I am not condoning drinking. I'm not condemning you to drink, but I'm not condoning drunkenness. You got me? Okay, follow that, because I've had people leave the church over that one principle. Uh, so you've got to be careful. Why, why, pastor? <laughs> well, yeah, smoking to some people is a sin. To other people, you know, it's, 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 it, oh, that's where the scruples come in. To others, they've been raising tobacco in Kentucky and North Carolina and other places like that. They've been support Tobacco supported the churches. You ain't heard the churches over there jumping up against Marlboro. They don't do it. They don't get upset about, um, uh, you know, Jacks, Jack Daniel and all them other Jacks in their life because that helps uh, support things in life. I had a friend that I have. In fact, I got several friends that work for Budweiser. Well, I don't look at them and say, you can't give your tithe money here because you work for Budweiser. I don't do that. Hey, man, I've learned to, if it's a dirty bird, I don't care. If I get fed by a dirty bird, let a raven feed Elijah. A raven can feed us. That's not a problem. Okay, that's another principle here. Get back to limit, limit your liberty. If, you, if somebody quits smoking and you invite them over to your house and you light up a Marlboro, what you're doing is affecting their life. Can't you just not smoke for an hour? Can you not just drink for an hour? Can you not just serve a bacon sandwich and have them feed, feed them something else? You understand what's going on here? So people have said, you need to wear a mask. <sighs> I have not worn a mask since this thing broke out. I've been, to, I, I just, I haven't felt the need for it. I read the first information about wearing masks. It said if you wear a mask, that it doesn't even keep the virus out. It just keeps your sneeze from going forward. That it won't. But on the flip side, if I go to your house and you're wearing a mask and you say, Pastor, you can come in here if you wear a mask, I promise you, I'm going to put my mask up and I'm going to walk into your house because I've gone to hospitals. And in that hospital, I've had to put on a mask before, and I've had to put on a, 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 a gown before to go in and visit with people. Now, when, in understanding that, I did it because I loved that person in there. I loved that patient. I want to go in there and pray for them. Some of them, it was the last face they saw before they left into eternity was my face. Amen. A picture that I made, took it in and showed it to a loved one. And next thing you knew, they were gone to be with Jesus. So if I have to limit my liberty by my love, I'm going to do it. This is essential. Whatever it takes, be wise. Now, there are certain people you ain't never going to please. You, you, I mean, you, it doesn't matter what kind of sandwich or about drinking, smoking, dipping. Uh, you ain't going to please them. They're just always going to be hard heads. For them people, let them go. Okay? Because some people will take this principle and they will wear you out over it. But if you love somebody, you limit your liberty by your love. Boy, that's good preaching, preacher. I wish the whole place could hear that. Amen. Let me close with this. Faith, hope, and love. These three. They are so essential. God saw you as essential. If he didn't, he would have never sent Jesus to earth. Out of the Message Bible, John 3.16 says, this is how much God loved the world. He gave His Son, His one and only Son. And this is why. So that no one need be destroyed by, re, by believing in Him. Anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all this trouble of sending His Son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. You and I 
are essential. I don't care what the world says about what is and what isn't. Faith, hope, love, they're essential. You are essential. God loves you so much, He sent Jesus. There's no greater love than that. Even Jesus said, no greater love than this than for a man to lay down his life for, for, for another, for his brother, for his sister. You are essential. So I, I reach for you today. I'm reaching for you. Limit your liberty by your love. Have faith to dispel fear. Have hope that tomorrow is going to be greater than today. That somehow the future of my children and children's children matters here on this earth. Don't buy into every conspiracy, but buy into the truth of the Word of God. Stand on it. Faith. This week, I want you to exercise your faith, man. I want you to believe God. What is it you believe in God for? The past, I'm about to just get my business back. How about that business being better than it was? I just want to get my church back. How about that church being better than what it ever was? That not only are you reaching people here in the pool, pulpits and, and the pews and the chairs, but you're reaching people all around the world with the gospel. Somebody needs to hear your voice. There are people that listen to my voice now. Then all of a sudden you feel connected to the little country church. You don't, you don't even live around here, but you feel connected to this preacher. And so let us pastor you through this venue. It, it goes against everything I once believed. But I didn't believe that you could sell bottled water. I didn't believe that you could promote text messaging. A lot of stuff I didn't believe. But all of a sudden I'm starting to realize that we are reaching people through the internet. And God is using social media to open things up. So I'm reaching for you, man. If you want this to be your house, start showing up on the internet. Start praying for your pastor and for this church and the ministry as we reach out to others. Start giving toward this place. I'm telling you, that once you make connections like that, things begin to change. What's really essential, absolutely necessary, extremely important? Faith, hope, love, and you. You are essential. Tell somebody about this broadcast. Share it if you would. A couple of quick announcements. You have the ability right now. Uh, as a matter of fact, our children's ministry. What is it called, David? Uh, it's going to be on the... TLCC Facebook page. We have a, a, a Zoom opportunity for our children. Just hunt for it. Hunt for something. Children on the Little Country Church page. Uh, our website Amen. You'll be able to find that. Also know that you can give several ways. You can give through holywildministries.com. I know that's a long name, holywildministries.com. You can give on our app. You can give uh, just anywhere you can find the Little Country Church and the connection to us, you can give that way. You can give through the mail and send it to our North Campus, to our office. Our office is open. We're glad you tuned in. And I have to believe that good things are ahead. You know that we have a youth camp. We believe in God for camp this summer for kids. Kids need camp. What happens at camp? They find out they're essential. They find out about faith, hope, and love. Amen. At camp. So we're praying that camp's going to take place. Now, we'd love for you to join us if you can. Out at our drive-in service at 1030. We'll be going live also. Facebook Live there. The Little Country Church. And by the way, I just thank God for the venue and the avenues to be able to reach people through the internet, through your phone. You know, my mom watches. That's what's scary. My mom watches. I love you, Mom. Until next week, we say success to you and success to the kingdom of God. And as you give today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commissions, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates, and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, and I say success to you and success to the kingdom of God.